this morning, James chapter 2. All right. Testing, testing. I'm a little loud. Got too much echo. You want me to turn it off up here or are you going to turn me down back there? Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing. Am I still coming over the speaker? I do not want to hear that speaker. There you go, Brother Paul. I don't hear it. If I want to sing without being heard or sling thing. The book of James is a meaty book. We started on it the other night on a Wednesday night. It is a tremendous book. It is, it is not a book for the faint of heart. It is a book of meat. You want to sink your teeth into something, uh, you can sink it into the book of James. James almost sounds like he's contradicting the other writers, uh, like him and Paul are at, at, at uh, odds with each other. Uh, if you read the book of Romans, the book of James, you're going to think the Bible contradicts itself. It does not. And nowhere does the Bible ever contradict itself. It's, uh, the, the contract is not the... Uh, Contradiction is not in the Bible, it's in you. And so um, there are some messages that I'm going to be preaching over the next um, little while, as long as God sees fit. I'm going to be preaching on salvation. And then I'm going to be preaching on submission. And then I'm going to be preaching on service. These are, these uh, submission and service is a, an area where our church where every child of God needs help in submission and service. But there can be no submission and no service without salvation. And so I want to preach upon biblical salvation. In the day that we are living in, the gospel and its power has been so watered down that I, I, I you know, Jesus said when he comes back, he said, will, will the Son of Man return and find faith? And, uh, and then Jesus told us there. That, that those that go in by the straight and narrow gate shall have eternal life, and there be few that do that. Now, now here is the problem today. The problem in, in our country, in our community, is everybody you run into is saved. I mean, they live any kind of life, and they say they were saved. We have this idea that as long as we walk down an aisle, down, down an aisle at one time, or we're a member of a church someplace, or something like that, then, then we're okay. Everybody seems to be saved. Look, look, if as many people were saved as what they say they are saved, we wouldn't be in the problem we're in today. We wouldn't have the crime rate. We wouldn't have the sin problem. We, we, we would not have the problems that we have uh, today in our country, in our community. So everybody tells you they're saved. I, I began to change my wording, and I like to ask people now, are you a servant of the Lord Jesus? That changes the tune. You know, they are one and the same. And I want to stress this. At no place in the Bible does the Bible ever say that you can have one part of Jesus and not have the other part. That's actually a heresy. Down through the years it was called the doctrine of antinomianism. And basically the doctrine is that since grace, since we're saved by grace, that grace will cover all. And so you can get by with everything. I'm about to read something to you that contradicts that doctrine. Look in chapter 2 of the book of James. James says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. In other words, don't think that salvation has anything to do with who you are uh, or with your standing in life. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that wear the gay clothing. Uh, that's not homosexual clothing, by the way. They stole that word from the Bible. That meant happy at one time, okay? Uh, and, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves and, and are become judges of evil thoughts? In other words, um, 
don't bring politics, don't, don't make church a political thing. And I don't, mean, I don't mean politics as in politics and in government. I, I mean in picking people. And so then he says in verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now that makes us all guilty if I understand that right. Is that right? Yes. Just go ahead and say it, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. For he that said do not commit adultery said also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now he's, he's just reiterating what he said over the book of Matthew. That if you don't have mercy on people, God's not going to have mercy on you. If you're too harsh, God's going to be too harsh on you. Whatever, you. whatever you give out, God's going to give it to you. You need to remember that. And then he says in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say, He hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? It's a rhetorical question. Can faith save him? It, it's a question that James already has the answer to. Now in the book of Romans, the Bible tells us that we're saved by faith. The book of Ephesians tells us that we're saved by grace through faith. So immediately what you want to do is say, well, yes. Yes, faith saves. Well, let's find out what he says. And uh, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Which simply means this. If all you have is faith, and the message today is faith enough, but here in your Bible, the Bible just told you that faith by itself is a dead faith. You see, the only faith that's going to help you is a living faith. A dead faith won't save you. And today, I'm afraid that I am viewing, and you are viewing, you, you, are, you are viewing a church living in an era that has a dead faith. And a dead faith is, is, is not a living faith. And the only faith that can save you is a living faith. Let me just put it down in simple terms. The only Savior that can save you is a living Savior. Right. Now the Bible says that God, Jesus says that God is a God of the living and not of the dead. God's about living. Everything God does is about living. He gives you everlasting what? Say it. He gives you eternal what? Say it. Everything about God is life. Jesus said, I've come to bring you life and that you might have it more abundantly, that your joy might be full. Every, you watch him raise the dead. He's always about the living, the living, the living, the living. So what God, what God is expecting from us is a living faith, not a dead faith. In other words, in, in other words you can say it, but just because you said it doesn't mean that you meant it. Have you ever told somebody you were sorry just, just to make peace, but you really wasn't sorry? Come on, help me out here. Man, yeah, I'm sorry, but you didn't mean it. And then, and then you tell somebody you love them, but you really don't love them. You just said it because it was the thing to say. Or, or, or maybe you said, I forgive you, but really once you walked away, there was no forgiveness there. You know, it's dead. It was just words. God said, this people, they, they, they worship me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. It's not alive. They're dead words. And so what he tells us here, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. 
Dead faith does not save. It has to be alive. It has to be living. Well, what is something that's alive and living? The heart has to pump. The veins have to have blood. The mind has to be alive. The limbs have to be moving. The lips have to move. There has to be emotions there. Show me an emotionless person. I'll show you a dead person. Where you find laughter, where you find tears, where you find a broken heart, where you find an excited heart, where you find emotions, you find something that's alive. And what James is saying here, it's dead, it's not alive. It's of alive, it's not dead. And so vice versa, if your faith is dead, if it hath not works, he said it's dead. Now let's just notice, let's find out. Remember, in the word of God, the Bible says, by the mouth of two or what? Three. Three. So you're going to find out truth by about two or three witnesses. You're going to find them. And so in verse 18, Yea, a man may say thou hast faith, and I have works. Listen now. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Boy, he is breaking this thing down. man. We're, we're, we've got the knife now. We're cutting into some meaty steak here. You tell me you have faith but you have nothing to back it up with. You don't have anything to back up that Jesus Christ is your Lord. There's nothing, there's not one thing in a person's life that points to Jesus. Look, I'm not saying you live a perfect life. I'm not saying you're living an extra clean life. I'm not saying that you're living above everybody else. But I want to tell you this, a child of God that has been born of God must exhibit something of Christ. There must be some part of a living Savior protruding from their life. If there is no life there, there is no God there. And, and so what he says this now, he said, if you don't have works, he said, I'll tell you this. He said, you, you talk about faith, but you don't have anything there to show it. And then he says this, he, he says, man, you know, I've got faith. But let me show you my faith by my works, by my life, by, by my love for God, by my love for the Word of God, for my, my love for the church of God, my love for the people of God, my love for, for witnessing, my love for praying, my love for singing, my love, I, my life. In other words, just look at me. You want to know if I've got faith? You want to know if I've got faith? You look at what I'm producing. Look at my fruit. Look at, look at the fruit coming off my trees. I've got pear trees out back, and me and Jackson and Annalena walk down there, and, and uh, where they fall off the tree, they hit the ground, they rot. You'll turn them over, and it's all rotten. Bad fruit, bad fruit, bad fruit. Nobody wants to eat bad fruit. Jesus said this, you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. Now, now when you find a fruitless, some trees produce nothing but bad fruit. And the Lord said if it produces bad fruit, cut it down. Some trees, some vines will only produce bad fruit, bad fruit, bad fruit. A, a, the, only, the only thing that produces bad fruit is a bad tree. The only thing that produces good fruit is a good tree. Now when I talk about fruit, I'm talking about the things of the Spirit of God, the things that are alive, the things that are joyful, the things that are happy, the things that are full of, full of measure, the measure of God. And so here is James, and James saying, now, now if, if you have bad fruit, bad works, you mark it down, it's a bad tree. Now, here's, here's our problem. Are you paying attention? For so long in the church, you and I in the generations that we live in, for so long we have looked at trees that bear the name of Jesus, but there is no fruit. There's no good fruit, there's no bad fruit. What in the world do we do with the tree that has no fruit? It's not good, it's not bad. Right now in your mind, you're thinking of those in limbo, aren't you? You're thinking of those people that you know that you've never seen anything, anything, anything from their life that points to Jesus Christ. You couldn't get saved. There's not one area of their life that anybody could get saved. You can't think of one conversation you ever had with them that would lead you to the Lord Jesus. I mean, just stop and think. Even people that go to church, you can't think of anything God-honoring or God-exalting. Now, it's not that they have a foul mouth. It's not that they commit foul things. It's not that they have this sinful life. They just don't have any fruit in their life. 
What do you do with them? Here's what Jesus said to do with them. When he came across a tree, and two times in the scripture, he came across a tree that was not bearing fruit. And, and the man said, let me take and let me, let, me, let, let me cultivate it. Let me put around it. Let me fertilize it. And he said, we'll come back next year and see what it does. He came back the next year having found no fruit. Wasn't that the fruit was bad. He said, having found no fruit, the Lord said, cut it down for it, for it wasteth and I'm paraphrasing this, it's wasting ground. Something else could be there that would be producing fruit. So the Lord said, cut it down. Now the thing about it is, is this tree belonged to the Lord. Cut it down. Only God knows what to do with them. Now I don't know about you. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a bad fruit. I've had enough bad fruit. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of rotten fruit hanging off my limbs. I don't want to be a bad fruit. And I don't want to be a fruitless tree. I don't know about you, I want, I, I want some part of my life. When I go in a grocery store, I want something in my life to, spell, to, to sing out Jesus yeah. is Lord. When, when I work, when I preach, when I sing, when people come in my home, some people, some people want to live next door as close to the gutter and as close to the field as they can without getting them on just close enough where they don't die and go to hell but it doesn't work like that now let's keep on reading here he said then he says uh, in verse 19 thou believest that there is one God thou doest well Man, here it is boy you're doing a good job there you're doing a good job you believe there's, you believe there's one God you do well there's a lot of people that believe in God. I want you to notice this. I want you to see what he says. Thou doest well. The devils also believe. And what? What's that word? Well, they know there's a God and they tremble. Doesn't make them saved. They're a long ways from being saved. Look, look, listen to just knowing there's a God doesn't save you. But knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior does. And he says this, But wilt thou know, O man, that faith without works is what? Here it is, number two. Faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham my father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son up on the altar? Let me pause right here and ask you a question, Grace Valley. Is this the inspired word of God? Yes. Is the book of James inspired by the Holy Spirit as much as the book of Romans is? Yes. Well, the book of Romans tells us that Abraham believed God it was counted unto him for righteousness. The, the book of Galatians tells us that Abraham believed God and, and he was saved by his belief. That Abraham had faith in God. So we're looking in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians and the, and the book of Ephesians and they're telling us that Abraham was justified by faith. Yet now we get in the book of, book of, the, the book of James, and James is telling us, was not Abraham justified by works? Does he not say that Abraham was justified by works? It looks like a contradiction, but it is not. When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. In other words, his faith was not complete, and his faith was not complete until something was added to it. It wasn't real. It was dead until something was added to it. Now, now, now let's pause right here lest you get confused. He did not say something was added to the gospel. He did not say something was added to Jesus Christ. It's not, G, it's not Jesus is not in question here. What's in question here is a man's faith. And so what he says this, he says, he says Abraham's faith was not complete until Abraham had works. And hang with me, I'm going to explain that to you. And so the Bible says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, which, which, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Listen, this thing, this is, this is about as plain as it gets. This is not a mystery. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. My goodness. Which simply means this. 
We know that Abraham believed God. The Bible does say Abraham believed God and God imputed unto him righteousness because he believed God. The thing about it is faith is the starting point, not the finishing point. Faith, because Abraham believed God, it created a change in him. Notice that word, he imputed unto him righteousness. When Abraham believed God, God took part of him and put it inside of Abraham. And so what Abraham did, Abraham could not help. He could not help but act upon that faith. And so what Abraham did then was Abraham listened to God, took his son Isaac, his only son Isaac, carried him up the mountaintop, and you know the story. There he began to sacrifice Isaac and would have offered him a burnt sacrifice unto the Lord. And so what happened was faith, faith was where it started, but it ended up on top of that mountain. And then it began to progress and keep on going. You have to understand, faith is the beginning point. But faith without works is dead. Listen to what he says in verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is what? That's three times in one chapter. Three times he tells you faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Which means this, if there's no godliness... If there's, no, if there's no life, if there's no part of holiness, if there's no part of repentance, if there's no part of turning to God. Let me ask you a question. Have any of y'all ever been in gross sin? Have you ever committed gross sin against God? You blatantly broke the law of God. Am I the only one in here that's done that? I blatantly broke the law of God. The law of God. You know what happened? I quickly felt the chastening hand of God. But it was more than that. I, I, my, my heart hurt me. Because I have hurt my creator. Let me ask you this. Have you stayed there in your gross sin? Did you stay there? You, you didn't stay there? Why didn't you stay there? You didn't stay there because you couldn't stay there. You're not there now. Hopefully, hopefully you're not there now because you couldn't stay there. God was long-suffering and God was merciful, but God brought you out of it. You see, a dead faith is not a faith at all. Let me tell you what the Dead Sea is like, the Great Salt Sea. The Jordan River heads up, begins to run down through the land of Canaan. It comes all the way down through the hill area, uh, uh, down through the valley area, and it comes out and empties into a little sea called the Dead Sea. The reason it's dead is because all the salt and all the minerals from the mountains all year long are coming down into the valley, and they're flowing down the Jordan, and they stop in the Dead Sea. And there the Dead Sea begins to evaporate, and the minerals and the salt come down, the magnesium, the calcium, you can go out and just float in it, almost walk on the water. It's so buoyant. It has so much salt in it. There are no fish in the Dead Sea. There are no porpoises in the Dead Sea. Uh, there, there's no dolphins in the Dead Sea. There are no stingrays in the Dead Sea. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea. If you stay in it very long, it will suck all, all the water out of you and you will die in the Dead Sea and rot and be eaten in the Dead Sea. It's dead because there's no outflow to it. And, and if there was outflow, then it could flush. But, but all that water is evaporated throughout that, the, the, throughout that Middle Eastern dry climate. And, and all the minerals are left, and it's dead. It's dead. And there's no life in it. And here's what James says. James says, show me a life without works. I'll show you a life that's dead and Christless. You didn't get to stay there because God wouldn't allow you to stay there. The reason you're sitting on a pew this morning and you're singing and you're smiling and you're rejoicing and you're happy is because Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you is greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He wouldn't let you stay there. Now what happens when a person stays there? Not saved. What happens when the fruit is bad? Not saved. Not saved. You cannot live in both worlds. You may cross the fence, and you do that daily to some degree. You may cross that fence, but the child of God must come back. 
You cannot stay there. I'm afraid that if the Lord came today, I am afraid if the Lord came today, there would not be millions missing. There would not be billions missing. There would be so few that would go that nobody would miss us. Now, how do I know that? Because Jesus said that. And few there be that go in thereat. Look, real grace produces a real life. Real salvation produces a real change. It may not be instantaneous. It may not, you may not go from, from, from black to white instantaneously, but I want you to understand that, that you are changing, changing, changing. The Bible says that we are changed from glory even unto glory into the same image. If you take a life, somebody claims they saved and they never changed, I want you to understand nothing could be any farther from the truth. What we have done is we have dethroned, we have so watered down salvation that, that literally I hear this all the time from everywhere I go. But Don, I remember the day I walked the aisle. You can walk the aisle, how, all, you walk all you want to. <laughs> you can walk as many aisles as you want to, but it won't save you. But Don, I remember when I sat and I prayed this prayer, pray all the prayers you want to pray, but it won't save you. But Don, I remember my baptism. You go ahead and we can hold you. Let me hold you down till you repent. It won't save you. I can get it. I'm sorry out of you. I can. Yeah. We'll get Brother Paul on the water. Hold you down. Just put his weight on both your arms until we can hear the bubbles coming up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But it won't save you. But I want you to know what it takes to be saved. Number one, it takes hearing the gospel. You remember old Brother Lynn saying he, he had never heard the gospel before? I mean, he, he had had it preached to him. He had had it told to him. But that day he said, I heard it. I want you to know on April the 4th, 1982, I heard the gospel. I heard it because the Spirit of God came in and knocked on my soul, knocked on my heart's door knocked on me, banged on me, and, and, and I knew then, boy, I, I must, I had to have some relief, and I did. I crawled down upon my knees, and that old building down at Walnut Avenue Baptist Church, and I knelt there, and I cried out for the Lord Jesus, Almighty King, Lord Jesus, save me lest I perish. There was life there. There was a call there. There was a crying out there. There was a hunger there. I may not remember all the words I said, but I remember this, I'll never forget the feeling like God was dangling me out over hell and I was about to drop off and burn forever and ever and ever and I knew that Jesus Christ was my only hope and I cried out to him. I went home saved that day by the way. Amen. I cried out to God a calling unto him. It is when the heart screams oh God save me. You can do that at seven, you can do that at 70, but you'll never get over the screaming that the heart had. The heart was hungry for God. The fear, the conviction, the calling of God upon you. Did you know the Bible tells us we are living in a time when, when everybody seems to think you can get saved when you want to. La, la, la. It's a lie straight out of the depths of hell. You do not come to God on your terms. People don't come to God on their thoughts or their timing or their terms. The book of Peter tells us that there is a day that God visits us and it is specifically called the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts in the day of salvation. There's a day that God calls you. There's a day that God awakens you. And you who were dead in trespasses and sin, has God, has God quickened. He awakened you. Something inside you woke up and you were, your heart, you, you knew in the depth of your heart you, you were not close to God. You needed God. And your heart was screaming to God. Oh, God, what can I do? And God was screaming at you, come unto me, all oh, ye that labor and are heavy laden. And so you came to God. You came to him. You came to him. Go and say it. I came to him. I came to him uh, when he called me. Let me reason with you for just a minute on this subject. People would come to me and they would say, now, Brother Don, the thief on the cross had no works. I'm not saying you're saved by works. I'm telling you that your salvation produces works. That's what James is talking about. Real faith produces a real life, a real change. You tell me. You tell me how in the world 
How in the world the creator God could come inside of you and you not live a changed life? I want to know that. I want to know how can the creator God come in you and you not live a changed life? That's what the world is saying. I hear this all the time. I want to tell you something. I, 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 well, let me ask you something. Did he change you? Yes. Come on, did he change you? Now, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm a long ways from being a Calvinist. But I was sharing, you know, Bap Baptists have the oldest confessions of faith that there are. And uh, I share with a preacher friend of mine, um, um, uh, an, an ancient, one of our oldest Baptist confessions of faith, and he read it. He came back and said, that's heresy. And I said, well, that's Baptist history. Now, what you're telling me, if you say it's heresy, you're telling me that's, that those Baptists back then were heretics. I said, it's a doctrinal issue. And he said, well, I don't believe in this irresistible grace stuff. And uh, irresistible grace means that God gave you grace and you couldn't resist it. Now, let's, let's pause here for just a minute. It's the one part about that that I do believe in. And I'll tell you why I believe in irresistible grace. Now, I'm not a Calvinist. In other words, I, I don't believe that God has picked some people and they're going to heaven and, and the rest are going to hell. I believe the door of salvation is open to whosoever will come. Let him come freely and take of the water of life. But I also believe that grace is irresistible. Let me, let me explain this to you. And I, I looked at him and I said, well, I, I don't know really about the Bible. I said, all I know is that when God gave his grace to me, it was irresistible for me. And he looked and said, I don't believe that. And I said, well, did you resist it? Because if you resisted it, you're not saved. You didn't resist his grace. Now, you may, you may claim to know people and tell me, well, they resisted it. No, they resisted the Holy Ghost. And re I couldn't resist his grace. His grace came in. And his grace did something. I realized I had to respond to the grace. And God came knocking on my heart's door. Hell was real. Heaven was real. Jesus was real. The death, the burial, the resurrection, it was all real to me. And God came knocking. And I felt the grace as it smothered around my heart. And I said, I want some of that on the inside. And that day God came in. It was not, it was not irresistible to be by, by no means. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you mine by my works. Now, it may not be great. Your works may not be as great as other people's works, but there's something there. It's not a dead life. Let me, let me back up and prove this to you. When you look at the, the Heroes Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and it starts off, by, it starts off with Abel. Abel believed God. But, but what did Abel? It's about what Abel did. Abel, Abel, Abel believed God, and he brought to God a more excellent sacrifice. Noah believed God. That, is, that, is that it? Is that as far as it went? Noah believed God and he built an ark to the saving of his household. Abraham believed God and he sojourned. Daniel believed God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed God. Sarah believed God. And all throughout Hebrews chapter 11, every, the heroes hall of faith, every single one of them backs up what James said. None of them just believed God and sat down. Every one of them believed God, jumped up and said like Paul did on the road to Damascus, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What can I do, God? That was what a changed heart does. Salvation creates a new you, a new person inside of you. Man, you are born again. You are born to live for God, born to serve God, born to be changed to the same image of God. Salvation does not save you and puts you on a pew. Salvation saves you, puts a shield on your arm, the helmet of salvation on your head, puts a sword in, in your hand and sends you forth to battle, crying out, conquering in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with a changed life, a changed home. Salvation, real faith. Faith always creates real action every time child of God changed changed tell me something are you changed has God changed you I mean is God working in you now let me ask you this right right now the preaching of God's word right now right now is it, it is it doing something to you is, 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 it, is it challenging your heart? 
Is it making you question your works? Is it making you question your belief? Is it making you question? Did you know the word of God says that we are let a man examine himself to see if he be in the faith? How do we do that? Well, we don't look back and see if we've been good enough, but what we do, what we, what we are supposed to do is to look back and say, okay, man, was there a time the Spirit of God called on me? Was there a time I cried out for God to save me? Did I know the wrath of God was upon me? Did I know destruction was coming? Did I cry out to Jesus Christ to save my soul? And did he touch me? And has he changed me? And, and have I been walking close to him? Have I been walking toward him? Or have I just had a dead, lifeless faith? Appreciate you sitting on the pew this morning, by the way. I'm so dirty, I can't see you. Appreciate you being there. I do. I really do. I appreciate you being there. I like to see people on their pews. We're missing some people this morning. But I love to see you in your places on your pews. I like that. Pew sitting's not enough. Oh, you'd be saved to be a pew sitter. That's not what God has for you. God don't want you doing. I love to come in here and watch them John and Romans being put together. Here, everybody making fun of each other. I like it. That's what my family does. We make fun of people. We laugh at people. We make fun of their toes. We make fun of their nose. We, we, I love to laugh. I was born to laugh. Go in there and we pick and we poke and we fun and we have a ball. Brother Joe's come and got them and he's picked them up and he's carrying them places and I can't help but think that one day they're going to fall into the hands of somebody. They're going to hear the sweet word of God, the sweet Holy Ghost, the thump on their heart and they'll be born again and they'll begin to do something for God. Wednesday night, gather around here praying. We've lost a generation of children. It's not necessary that our children are, are living ungodly lives, but so many of them have fruitless lives. They're fruitless. They, they, have, they have no good fruit coming off. You, could, you, couldn't pick, you couldn't pick something related to God off their tree if you tried. You couldn't find it. And I'm thinking a whole generation, a whole generation is gone that, that now, I mean, we look and see so much bad fruit around us. I'm looking for some trees with, with some good fruit. So when I look out and I see some young people that, 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 that have good fruit coming off of them, I, I rejoice. I pray harder for them. I want to look at my children and my grandchildren, and I, I want to. I want to see somebody pick some good fruit off them. I want to come by your house and pick good fruit off of it. I want the Lord when He comes to find fresh, good fruit hanging from our trees. And here's what James says. James says J James gives us no fruitless trees right here. Show me your faith by your works. I'll show you my faith. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you mine by my works. In other words, there's something there. There's something there. Now let me ask you, what's there for you? What's there for you? Are you producing good fruit? Is there, is there, is there good fruit? If, if, we could, if, we could, if I could see you as a tree this morning, and God does, if I could look at you as a tree, could I come by your tree and pick off the fruit of joy? Mm. <laughs> well, we're going to do what we can to change that, I promise you. <laughs> How to get them. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. Thou hast perfected praise. A little truth. I don't know if he was, was that Jackson? I don't know if he was answering for him or answering for me. I'm just not real sure. And somebody ought to come off and be able to pick something. Man, there's some love. There's some joy. There's some peace. There's some long suffering. There's some mercy. There's some goodness. There's some righteousness when there's nothing. When there's nothing there. When, when, the, when, when, when if, if Abraham had no place to sacrifice Isaac, if Noah had nothing to build, we would have never known. If Daniel had no lion's den, if there was no fiery burning pit, we, we would have never known. But we do know. 
But we do know. And I love it. I, I hate to see a child of God get in sin. I hate my sin. I hate it. Somebody say, I hate sin. I hate it. I hate what it does to me. I hate the way it makes me think. I hate the way it makes me talk. I hate, I hate how it affects our church. I hate how it affects the world. I hate how it affects the presidency. I hate it. You understand that? God hates it. But in his mercy and long suffering, he still forgives. I hate it. I hate it. But then along with that, you come along and there's that good fruit. You pick it, you pick it, you pick it. We would have never known, we would have never known that Lot was saved if Peter hadn't have told us. For the last 4,000 years, we, we would have, ministers would have stood in the pulpit during the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and we would have preached Lot straight in the depths of hell. Lot died and went to hell because he wouldn't listen. Lot died and went to hell. Except that Peter tells us that this righteous man's soul was vexed day by day in seeing and in hearing their ungodly deeds. Now here's what happened. While Lot, listen, while Lot, while Lot may have died a saved man, his children did not. Standing on the side of that mountain, Mrs. Lot looked back and turned into a pillar of salt because she did not believe God. She looked back because down in that valley was probably her grandchildren. She had daughters down in, in the city of Sodom. And when the fire began to rain down, she looked back. I, no, no, no doubt, we may have all looked back and thought, oh my, oh my God, it was true. And there she turned to a pillar of salt. Lot went on up with those two daughters of his, and both of them got him drunk committed incest with him and brought forth two very ungodly nations out of those two boys from, from their daddy granddaddy. No fruit to bad fruit. I want you to listen to this and I'm, I'm real serious about this. Grace Valley, it's not enough it's not enough for you to die saved. It's not enough for you to die saved. It's not enough for me to stand behind the desk or stand beside your grave and say, I knew this person and they love the Lord and they're going to heaven and one day we'll see them again. If that's as far as it goes, you failed at life. You are a failure. You have failed and I have failed miserably. If that's as far as it goes, we have failed. No. God help us know. I'm afraid that's where we're living at today. God help us know. I want to stand on the other side of glory. I want to be looking at the pearly gates. And I want to see it open for every one of my children. I want to stand there and watch them come in. And I want to stand there. And I want to wait for every one of my grandbabies. I want to stand there and I want to see Abigail come through. I want to see. Felicity come through. I want to see Hunter come through. I want to see Fisher come through. I want to look and see uh, uh, Cole Ride come through. Uh, I want to see Felicity and her new husband come through. I want to look and I want to see Jackson and Annalene come through. But it's not just that. I want to see their spouses. I'd like to stand there with my dad and my papa and watch my generations one by one come through that gate. Wouldn't you like that? And before you can expect 
the trees behind you to bear fruit, then you must bear fruit. You must come by faith, but you must also come willing that God create in you something in you that goes beyond just words and just a form, something that's alive, something that's real, something that comes out of you no matter what. Somebody say amen. amen. So this morning, would you stand please? Brother Jim, let's have a song. Miss <coughs> Annalene says it's time to quit, Paul Paul. It's not a question this morning of if you're going to heaven. I hope that you are. It's a question of is your family or those behind you or the grandchildren coming. People. Listen now. People must see in you something they don't have, something they need. People must see Christ in us, the hope of glory. They must hear him come out our mouth. They must see the joy of Christ in our life. We must look different. We must talk different. We must be different. We don't have to fake it. We don't have to fake being a child of God. All we have to do is let Him, let Him have control. When He has control, people can't help but see Him. They told Paul he was mad. Paul came before them. They said, Paul, thou art mad. You're crazy. Paul said, we become fools for Christ's sake. It's all right to be embarrassed. It's all right. All the way on the cross, listen to this. All the way hanging there on top of Mount Calvary beside the Lord Jesus was two thieves. One went to heaven, one went to hell. That one that went to heaven looked at Jesus. You say, well, but that he, he had nothing. He had no works. You're a fool if you think that. Listen to what he said. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. My goodness. Those, those few words have gone all over the universe. We've been preaching about them for 2,000 years. There's more came out of those few seconds of life in that one thief and some whole lives put together. Lord, remember me. All he had left was his mouth. Show me my, by faith without works, and I'll show you mine by my works. You have works. You have some part of you that reflects Jesus. I love this little song, little Gaither song. Number eight, little Gaither song, I, I think. I absolutely love it to no end. I will serve thee. I will serve thee. Are you a servant of the Lord Jesus? Are those that you love servants of the Lord Jesus? If not, you serve him and see if they can't see you serving him. Let's sing, little Jim.